How should one read Cormac McCarthy? Well, obviously, relaxing in nature with a good Cormac McCarthy book and no worries in your mind is the best. But what perspective should we read Cormac McCarthy from? Because when we crack open literary criticism, there are an, an infinite amount of ways to examine a novel. And some of the more popular ones in the McCarthy world are environmental or nature approaches, Nietzschean, masculinity, critiques of the technological world, and new criticism points of view. Because if you ask McCarthy, how should I read your book? He would say, everything is in the book. And I've always felt that this is obviously a cop-out. But the McCarthy bros go crazy for this because to understand and to be able to engage in not just literary, literary criticism on your own, but to read others requires you to be a well-read individual in the humanities and liberal arts. And that is somewhat antithetical to a lot of McCarthy's characters. And we like characters that resonate with us. John Grady Cole, Billy Parham, Cornelia Sutri, they are not sitting and reading the phenomenology of sociology journal. But Cormac McCarthy is. And McCarthy is a genius because he gets away with giving us basically nothing. When we look at his work, the work, there are no plots. There is a man on a journey who confronts some trouble, but McCarthy is known for writing in that kind of epic style that's plotless. His two masterpieces, Sutri and Blood Meridian, don't have a plot. He also engages in little to no characterization. We get, you know, because of his third per his close third person point of view most of the time, little to no interiority. And he never gives like descriptions of the character. We never heard Sutri was 6'3 with jet black hair and wore, you know, raggedy pants. We never get any of that. And so what do you have left, everyone, if we don't have any plot or any characterization? That is like if you read any creative writing manual, what you need to like write a novel. Like it's either one or the other most of the time. It's best if you have both, but it's either plot driven or character driven. McCarthy has none, but the way he gets away with all this and the way I think you should read McCarthy and this is where all the secrets and deepest knowledge is embedded is McCarthy's use of contrast that is why McCarthy takes such a long time to revise his novels he works every single day and he'll have a novel done he can get one of a first draft or you know of one of his novels done in a couple in a couple months but it may take him 10 to 60 more years to release it and that's because he's embedding contrast, these little hidden secrets all throughout it. And that's what makes McCarthy scholarship so potent. It's very reminiscent of uh, Hemingway scholarship. It's, you know, with the iceberg theory, because once you start looking at McCarthy's use of contrast, it opens up Pandora's box in terms of what you can experience while reading McCarthy. And one of the sneaky ways he gets away with this is he utilizes nature and he takes a very German idealist point of view. He kind of layers nature as a setting excuse me he <laughs> as a setting that's a character the character is, is nature in mccarthy's novels but it isn't overt there aren't fairies like leading the way and like bullshit like that no he makes this silent character and contrasts that in almost every single one of his novels with the new screwed up world i mean i think every single cormac mccarthy novel is a critique of the new world that's coming on. And so we have all that. But even deeper than that, McCarthy likes to engage in natural contrast with characters. When a character gets introduced um, at certain points in the novel or reintroduced, he usually changes his sentence structure to introduce them with natural elements. For instance, in The Orchard Keeper, he uh, attaches the 91-year-old Arthur Ombi to werecats. Yes, he explores werecats like werewolves. And he uses the absurdity of werecats to contrast the absurdity of the new world that Arthur Ombi is experiencing. He was a man who lived through the Civil War, and now he's experiencing the most rapid expansion of a territory in, in American history. The, uh, the area around Knoxville and the Appalachians, the Great Smoky Mountains, how fast it progressed in a couple decades is absolutely insane. And like I said, some have argued it was the fastest ex expansion in American history. And this comes up in very subtle ways all throughout his work. You know, when you, like, for instance, just dive deep into Blood Meridian, you see that McCarthy is very fluent in alchemy and that all throughout the novel, he is adding alchemical elements to the work because he was interested in the occult and Carl Jung, <coughs> Heraclitus and others, and chemistry, alchemy, and a lot of nature in general 
is the contrast of different elements coming to- together to make a unique body. And I think that's where the spirit of McCarthy's inherent beauty comes from. That when, when you are with like a lover, right? If you have a wife, uh, a husband, you guys aren't two people. When you're together, you create this third body. Robert Bly describes this beautifully in his poem, The Third Body. A man and woman sit near each other, and they do not long at this moment to be older or younger, nor born in any other nation or time or place. They are content to be where they are, talking or not talking. Their breasts together feed someone who we do not know. The man sees the way his fingers move. He sees her hands close around a book she hands to him. They obey a third body that they share in common. They have made a promise to love that body. Age may come, parting may come, death will come. A man and a woman sit next, sit near each other. As they breathe, excuse me, as they breathe, they feed someone we do not know, someone we know of, whom we have never seen, whom we have never seen. I love, if I can slip Robert Bly into any conversation, I will. He, I think he's one of America's greatest poets, probably the most influential poet, and no one knows who he is. Anyway, when Two characters and, two, and these contrasts happen in a Cormac McCarthy novel, whether it's, it's a relationship between two characters or one of the contrasts he's making between a character and nature or the machine or God or whatever, this third body gets created. And McCarthy's minimal and maximalist writing style makes this really crazy because McCarthy knows, you know, from William Faulkner how to write a very beautiful minimal style, but what McCarthy brings to the table that he didn't get from Hemingway or Faulkner or anyone else is that infernal, crazy style that, for instance, you see in like the Blood Meridian Comanche attack, but in a lot of other places, even way more so. And this in, in and of itself, being able to write minimally like Faulkner and being able to, to do this infernal style is a contrast. And the third body it creates is a rhythm and a flow that sucks you in because you are never necessarily lulled. You know, the only time you really get lulled in a Cormac McCarthy novel is like in the dialogue. Sometimes there'll be like pages of like a bullshit conversation and you're like, oh my God, like why are they even talking? And so what is your favorite way to read Cormac McCarthy? If you're looking at it from a perspective, what did you guys think of me talking about Cormac McCarthy's contrast? I really want to start to show this off a lot more and dive deeper into this topic because it won't, it will not just be useful for learning about you know, McCarthy's works more, but for us who are writers out there to learn that sentence structure and contrast is really the basis of all great stories.